I want to welcome you here this morning. If you're new and we haven't met, my name is Adam, and it's so good that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. We are starting a brand new series we are calling The Intimate Pursuit. The Intimate Pursuit, and the goal during this series is that you would develop a friendship with God. That you would learn to develop this friendship with the Lord. This might be a new concept for you, but how many of you want an intimate friendship with the Lord? That's what I want for you more than anything else. We said a lot around here that our prayer would be that our corporate encounters with God would lead to what? Daily personal encounters with God. I just believe though that if people learn to have a daily personal encounter with the Lord and to learn how to steward their time in the secret place, then what will begin to happen in this place is a greater move of the Spirit of God as we gather. Why? Because As we encounter God on an individual time, we'll come in this place with such hunger and desire to meet with Him, that we'd have this intimate pursuit, not just personally, but also corporately. Amen? So this week, here's my goal. My goal is to place inside of you this hunger and desire for the Lord. There's no other goal. There's no other agenda this morning. Just this hunger and desire to meet with the Lord in the secret place. Now, in two weeks, I'm going to give you some nuts and bolts of how I personally steward my time with God and how what the Bible says to do as far as how you steward your time with the Lord. Um, Now, I just want to say this too. There is no right way of doing it. This is just a method during the series. It's a method, but I promise you if you put these things into practice that your life will be forever changed. I'm just so convicted that, man, if we learn to spend time with the Lord, then literally everything else just works itself out. What happens is our perspective changes, the way we view things changes. If we just learn how to commune, how to spend time with the Lord and how to have this intimate pursuit after Him. So I'll give you some nuts and bolts in two weeks. Next week, though, is Mother's Day, so we'll have another Mother's Day message. It's going to be absolutely amazing. But let's start off with Matthew chapter 6 this morning, verse 6. It says this, But you, when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the what? the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will what? Reward you openly. I've entitled my message this morning, Intimate Friendship with God. Intimate Friendship with God. If you like my notes, you can text notes to the numbers on the screen, and what's in front of me will be sent to you, and you can follow along. Let's pray. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us as we open his word. Holy Spirit, we come humbly before you today. God, we know that we have to have you. That literally, God, without you, we're nothing. Like nothing separates us from the world except for you. All of the religions, they do great things and they have great motives, but the one thing that distinguishes us and separates us from all other people is we serve the living God who desires true and authentic relationship with us. And so God, I pray as we come into this series that Lord, we would learn how to have this intimate friendship that God, you so desire with us. Lord, we don't want to just offer lip service to you. We don't want to just be people who go through the motions. We don't want to be just hearers of the word, but Father, we want to be doers of the word. God, I pray that, Lord God, that, Lord, I would not be seen, Jesus, that only you would be seen. God, rid all flesh in this room, including myself. 
that, Lord, you would be lifted up and that you would be glorified. We love you so much, Jesus. And we thank you, God, that you were with us and you were in this place. God, we pray that, God, you would take your Logos word today, that you would make it rhema, you'd make it alive in our hearts, God, that, Lord, it would be active and it would be breathing, Father, that, Lord, we would walk out of this place changed forever with a hunger and desire to meet with you in the secret place. In Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said this morning, come on, amen, amen, amen. amen. Have you ever wanted a relationship with someone so bad that you just relentlessly pursued that person? Many men in this room right now, you're like, yeah, that was me, while many women in this room are like, nope, I didn't have to do that. I pursued my wife so hard. I met my wife at a wedding, and from the moment I saw her, like, man, I've got to get to know this girl. And then I started talking to her, I was like, okay, uh, she's got an amazing personality. We're clicking right now. Like, we've got to take it to another level beyond this friendship thing. And so it took a little bit of time because my friends made it awkward. But we started developing this friendship. I knew that I wanted to marry her, though, when I went to the youth group in which she was interning at. And so I went to the youth group she was interning at. I was actually interning at my church as a worship, uh, as a worship um, director. And... Uh, I saw the way she prayed for the youth. She prayed with numerous people that day and just kind of poured into them, and I saw her passion and her love for people, and I said, man, I've got to marry this girl. And so we ended up going on our first day, went downtown, but before all that, in order to, to land her, to go on this first date, you know, I wasn't very smooth with, with anyone. I was not... I didn't, I didn't have the, the mojo, so to speak, or whatever you want to call it. I, I only dated two people my entire life, and one other person other than my, than my wife. I wish it was only her. But I uh, drove about 45 minutes to an hour to go give her uh, a card to tell her how I felt, a love letter basically to tell her how I felt, and flowers, and dropped it off while she was working late at night. And the rest was history when on our first date, as soon as I got a real full-time job, man, I asked her to marry me, and six months later we were married. The rest is history. I pursued her relentlessly. I knew that the Lord wanted me to marry her when I saw her praying for those teenagers. Have you ever pursued something relentlessly? I want to tell you this morning that God is pursuing you relentlessly. He is crazy about you. He loves you so much. Matter of fact, he sent his only son to die for you. Because he, why? Because he wanted relationship with you. And what he desires more than anything else in your life is relationship with him. More than anything else, he wants to have this intimate friendship with you. How come we've made church about so many other things so often, other than just relationship with Jesus? We've made church so many times about a social club, a social gathering. God forbid we've made it at times, sadly, and man, we need to repent about entertainment. If we ever entertain people in the kingdom of God, we've got to entertain them to keep them. I'm not interested in entertainment. We've made it about so many other things than just relationship with Jesus. We've made it oftentimes just about doing something good, which is, it's okay to do something good. But when it comes down, and the boy it boils down to is just relationship with the Lord. As we gather together in community, what are we doing? We're encouraging one another and our relationship with God. And we need that community to encourage one another in our relationship with God. You see, the story throughout the history of the world is a story of God pursuing his people for intimate relationship with him. From the time in the garden where Adam and Eve, they walked with God in the cool of the noonday. What happened, though, was sin came in. The aid of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil God came looking for them in the garden, and he was calling out to them, but what did Adam and Eve do? 
They hid. They hid from the Lord. But notice that God still came in the garden and was calling out to them. You see, we're the ones in our sin that hides ourselves from God. God's not hiding himself from us. Sin does separate, but it's on our own doing. It's not God that separates us. And so, the people of Israel, time and time again, they turn from God. There's a characteristic and attribute of God in the Old Testament that we don't really think about this characteristic often when referring to God, and that is that he was jealous for the people of Israel. When he gave Israel the Ten Commandments, he said, you will have no other gods before me, for I am the Lord God, and I am jealous for you. Jealousy is a, jealousy is a negative human emotion, but here when in context of the Lord and how he is jealous for us, it is not negative at all, because he does not want to compete with anything when it comes to relationship with you, an intimate relationship with you. Nothing else he wants in the way when it comes to relationship with you. And then underneath the new covenant, it says, the spirit yearns jealously for us. The spirit of God, the spirit that lives inside of you, if you're giving your life to Jesus, I'm here to tell you this morning, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And that same spirit that lives inside of you yearns jealously for you. It yearns jealously for jealously for you. He so desires to spend time with you and commune with you and to have this intimate friendship with you. That word yearns means craves. To desire greatly or to crave. The Holy Spirit craves your companionship. It craves your companionship. We've made this statement around here a good bit that belief determines where you'll spend eternity, but behavior determines how you'll spend eternity. Belief determines where you'll spend eternity. Behavior determines how you'll spend eternity. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth, and believe in your heart, then you will be saved. If you confess and believe, salvation is yours. But do you have friendship with God? Just, you, just because you confess and believe does not mean you have friendship with God. It just means you've done enough to get to heaven. How many know we gotta do much more than just get to heaven? We're called to do much more than just get to heaven. So belief determines where you'll spend eternity. Behavior determines how you'll spend eternity. Look at this, this scripture here, Matthew 16, 27. It says, for the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. So if our behavior will determine how we spend eternity, what does God want for us to do more than anything else? Because what he wants to do, it matters, right? What God desires for us and what he wants us to do, it really does matter. Jesus says in John 14, 15, that if you love me, you will obey my commandments. Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. What is the commandment that God desires more than anything else for us to do? More than giving to the poor, more than discipleship even, more than evangelism. What does he desire more than anything else from us? What is the greatest commandment that God has given us? Matter of fact, the disciples asked this question. What did he say? That you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. For this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is what? That you would love your neighbor as yourself. Somehow, sometimes we've gotten these two things backwards. 
that you would love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind and with all of your strength. For this is the first and the greatest commandment of all. This is Jesus telling his disciples this. If you love me, you obey my commandments. Why is love and our love for God the greatest commandment? Why is our love for the Lord the commandment that God wants from us more than anything else? It goes back to Matthew 6, 6, that he will reward you when you spend time in the secret place. Listen, what we do in this life one day in the next life, we will receive rewards. And if we do anything outside of our love for God, it's going to be burnt up. Why? Because it's just religion. If it's coming from a place where we've gotten these two, <laughs> these two commandments backwards, I'm not talking about love for people, I'm talking about love for God. Because we can't really love people well without having been with the one who has perfect love. You see that? Anything we do and it's done out of just sheer, I just want to help someone without love for, not that there's anything wrong with that, I'm not, I'm not saying that at all, I'm just saying there won't be rewards in the next, next place. And God wants to reward us. There is rewards when we get to heaven. And the greatest, the greatest commandment is what? You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all of your strength. It's when you can come to a place and you say simply, Lord, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Not that you love what he can do for you, but you love him because of this friendship that you have developed with him. Is this okay this morning? Are you getting this? I just, be I just believe that the Lord's taking us to a new level. He's taking us to a new place as a church. He's teaching us how to have an intimate friendship with him. In Psalm 91, you know, the Lord gave me this psalm for us back about three, four months ago. And I believe is really what the Lord is teaching us right now. Let's read this, Psalm 91, 1 through 2. He who dwells, say dwells, in the secret place of the Most High, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. He who dwells in the secret place. The secret place is where you go meet with the Lord. Before we talk about the secret place, let's first talk about this word dwell. Notice here, it's not he who visits the secret place will rest underneath the shadow of the Almighty. It is he who dwells. Why is it dwell? Because he's literally waiting to meet with you in that place. It's a place where you and him and you go to and he's waiting on you to commune with you and to develop this relationship with you. He's waiting, he's wooing you back into this place. Many people I've, I've heard say before, and, I, and I would agree, like you need to be doing this. Well, I don't need a secret place because I just pray continually. But there's something about going to a place where God can speak to you where there's no distractions. Where you open the love letter of God, his word, he begins to speak to you through his word. There's something about having a place set aside where it's just you and the Lord where you meet. For me, uh, you know, I'll go spend time with the Lord on my back patio, outside, depending on the weather, or I'll go into my office area. For maybe some of you in this room, it might be you go 
into a, just a corner or nook in your house, or you might have a room set aside, or you might go outside. I don't know what it might be, but you need a place where you go, where you commune, and you fellowship with the Lord. And he's literally waiting for you in that place. Isn't that incredible to think about? You know, this is how sometimes I feel, and anything that I say in this series, I really pray it's not to bring any uh, glory to myself or for me to look good. I just simply want to share with you my relationship with God and look at Scripture and how it, how it operates with it. So there's moments in my life where I'll be just be hanging out, you know, with people, and I can literally just feel like this desire in my heart just to go be with Jesus. It's like, man, I've got all these distractions, I've got all this stuff going on right now, and I just feel the Holy Spirit, because he lives inside of us, right, speaking to me and almost kind of like, Adam, come on, come spend time with me. Come spend time with me. Come spend time with me. And I feel the tug of the Holy Spirit to go into my secret place and just spend time with Jesus. Just spend time in his word. Just pray. Just talk to the Lord. That's what prayer really is, is talking back and forth to God. In order for you to have this, though, There'll be moments in your life where you've got to say no to even good things so that you can say yes to God. You've got to make God your priority. What I mean is you've got to say no oftentimes to an unhealthy lifestyle. Why? Because you won't have energy to go spend time with the Lord in the morning. Because an unhealthy lifestyle has called you to be sick and to be tired, honestly. And so you've got to say yes to a healthy lifestyle so you can say yes to God. Sometimes you'll say, you have to say no to staying up late so you can say yes to God in the morning. I know for me, man, if I stay up late, it's very unlikely that I'll go spend time with the Lord in the morning. I'm a human being. I've just learned for myself, sometimes I've got to say no to staying up late and just so I can say yes to God because doesn't relationship with the Lord just a relationship with your spouse or with your kids, doesn't it require time? You know, I can be married and be the husband to Laura on paper, but if I never spend time with her, do I have a relationship with her? I can be a father to, to Ruth and Caleb, but if I never spend time with them, do I have an actual relationship with them? If you want an intimate relationship with the Lord, you, it requires you spending time with Him, which then causes you to say no to some good things as you can yes, yes to God. Now, some of you in this room, intimacy is just like a word. You're like, man, that's, just, that's a weird word, Adam. I don't really like that. That's kind of ooey-gooey, too emotional for me. Intimate means this. It just simply means closely acquainted closely acquainted. So what do you do? You go to the secret place behind a closed door to meet with Jesus every day in the secret place. It's a place you've set aside where you become closely acquainted with the person of the Holy Spirit, with God who is your good Father who has good things for you. Now, there's also, I want to just say this, there's Something about the principle of first. When you look at Scripture, giving of your first fruit, giving of your income and your first fruit to the Lord, there's something about the principle of first. There's something about waking up in the morning and giving your first 15 minutes, your first 30 minutes, your first hour to the Lord. There's something about that. In Scripture, it says this, in Psalm 17, 14, when I awake, I will see you face to face and be satisfied. When I awake. Psalms 90, 14, satisfy us each morning with your unfailing love so we may sing for joy to the end of our lives. Satisfy us what? Each morning. Now, some people will say, man, just give, uh, give the best time or whatever that is to the Lord. But I'm, I'm just, I just know myself, and I know other people, and I talk to them from experience. I just kind of think, say, man, you got to spend your first uh, hours, your first hour, your first minutes, first 15 minutes, first 30 minutes, whatever it might be, with the Lord. Why? Because, man, if you don't do it in the morning, it's likely you're not going to do it. 
It's just what I've experienced and what I've seen in ministry. So I would encourage you, go to the secret place first thing in the morning. Because there, satisfy us each morning with your unfailing love. I mean, it's literally where God is waiting for you to pour out his love, to show you things, to speak to you. Satisfy us each morning with your unfailing love so we may sing for joy to the end of our lives. You know, we see also Jesus escaping to go be with his father in the secret place. In Luke 5, 16, it says, Jesus often withdrew to the lonely places and prayed. Listen, if Jesus withdrew to lonely places to pray, and we're talking about the Son of God, because he needed to commune with the Father, <laughs> how much more do we need to be able to do that? If Jesus was dependent, withdrew to lonely places to pray and to seek God, I don't know about you, but man, I had definitely need that to make it in this life today. What we do in the secret place is we fix our gaze, we fix our attention, we fix our focus on him, just as we sang earlier, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. What we are doing in the secret place is we're turning our eyes and turning our gaze towards Jesus. Look at this, Colossians 3.1, since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts, say set your hearts. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Hebrew 12, 1 through 2, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter, the finisher of our faith. How do we throw off the weight of this world? How do we throw off sin? We've got to go to the secret place and we've got to look to Jesus. We've got to look to Jesus. We've got to set our attention, our affection, our love on Him. And there's something about it where we leave the weight of this world and the sin behind. And everything just kind of fades away. You know, life has a way of throwing crisis at us, doesn't it? Life has a way of just throwing curveballs at us and things happen that are difficult and hard. You may be here this morning saying, Adam, how in the world is this message helping me? How in the world is this, you know, Adam, I've got bills piled up. I've just lost a loved one. I'm struggling with major amounts of grief, of pain. Adam, I'm surrounded by relationships that are hard and difficult and people who necessarily aren't living for the Lord. In my life, it's just hard. Adam, how is this message helping me? Listen, when you learn to run to the secret place in the middle of crisis, when things are hard, it's like all of a sudden, it doesn't mean that what happened didn't happen. It just means that it starts to fade away. Your perspective changes and the worry and the anxiety begins to fade away. The more you spend time, the more it fades. Sometimes things will take years. But every time you go into the secret place, it's like the Holy Spirit comes down and he heals a place in your heart. Because the Holy Spirit can come and take all, we're like an onion, you know? We've many of you in this room, you've dealt with so much pain, so much hurt, hurt by other people, been betrayed, you name it. And you're dealing with all this stuff. Every time you go into the secret place and you really learn how to steward that time with the Lord, it's like the Holy Spirit comes in and he starts to heal those places in your heart. Now my family, many of you have heard this story before, but my family, went through a major crisis when I was only five years old. It was hard, it was difficult, we experienced incredible amounts of grief. And I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit at just four years old because I believe the Lord gave me that at such a young age because when I was five, right around Christmas time, my mom passed away from lung cancer. She had never smoked a cigarette in her life. 
And it happened incredibly quickly. And I remember hearing my dad after my mom had passed away. My dad's alone in the room, and he's just weeping and crying. He's just crying, and he's crying out to God. I can literally hear him crying out to God, God, help me. Like, as a five-year-old, I'm hearing this. As a six-year-old, I'm hearing this. And he's going through this grief. He's going through this turmoil. But what I know is that he went to the Lord and into the secret place. Not only that, but he brought myself and my sister along in this process. So what he would do, (laughs) I'm going to try this out, see how this goes. What he would do is he'd gather my sister and I around and he'd grab his guitar and we would sit there and we would worship God. In the middle of our crisis, in the middle of our pain, And we would just sit there and we'd sit in his presence. And God would just begin to work on us and heal us from this pain. So you can imagine just how difficult and hard it was. And how desperately we needed the touch of the Holy Spirit. You see, if you can learn to go to the Holy Spirit in the middle of crisis, he'll come and he'll heal your pain. He'll heal your pain. And so we would lift up a song to the Lord. I remember this is one of my favorite songs growing up as just a five, six, seven-year-old. One of my dad's favorite. And we would sit there around in the room full of grief, but just worshiping God. And we'd sing, Lord, you are more precious than silver in Lord you are more costly than gold in Lord you are more beautiful than diamonds in nothing I desire compares with you you see everything all of our struggles it would just fade away in that moment you might be saying Adam I don't play guitar (laughs) but you can put on some worship music in the middle of crisis, and you can encounter God. You see, I learned how to encounter the Lord through my dad. And I learned at a very early age because of this crisis that we were going through. And I learned how to go to him, and he would bring this peace and even joy. I remember growing up, man, people would say to me, Adam, why do you smile so much? (laughs) And that's a miracle inside of itself when you've lost a mom. I remember getting made fun of because I smiled so much. But why did I smile? Because I was with the Lord. My dad brought me into the secret place to spend time with him. And even in the middle of crisis, you can have peace. You can experience the love of God. You experience the joy of the Lord. And so I developed this relationship with God at an early, early age. Well, what a gift that was. As a 16-year-old, I encountered God for the first time in my adult life. And I said, Lord, I'm surrendering my life to you. It was in the middle of a worship service, and I felt, man, his presence in a way that I felt like, man, I never experienced above the age of probably 10. And so I was, honestly, I got to a place where I just wanted to be with the Lord all the time. Just as I kind of shared before, you know, I was... Um, it's almost like the Lord wanted to spend time with me even when I was in, in, a, in a car with friends. And this might sound weird to you guys. It's really honest, honestly where I was at. My worship pastor, man, he would, he'd play. He'd play and he would sing and he'd worship after our midweek services. 
until like 11.30 at night. And I remember sitting there and just spending time with God at the altar and just worshiping Him. I remember the cry of my heart always was, God, I just want more of you. Lord, I'm thirsty for you. God, I'm hungry for you. There was this song that even, you know, you can imagine like when you're dealing with grief, it's really something that you never really fully get over when it's like losing your mom. But the Holy Spirit still can come in and heal. So I've dealt with it at different times in my life. But, you know, one song that he'd always sing that always brought healing to me in the middle of this pain that I was experiencing was. And all who are thirsty Oh, who are we? And come to the fountain. Dip your heart in the streams of life. Let the pain and the sorrow. You can imagine, man, when that lyric hit, the pain and the sorrow and the the pain that I was experiencing, and there's this next one. And be washed away by the ways of His mercy. As deep cries out to deep we see and come, Lord Jesus, come. Man, in the wave, the waves of his love, I would just sing that, man. It would just wash over me. And come, Lord Jesus, come. Cause I just love you, Lord, just love you. You sing that with me. And come, Lord, Jesus, come. And come, Lord, Jesus, come. that out. And come, Lord Jesus, come. To come, Lord. And come, Lord Jesus, come. The Bible says if you draw near the Lord, He's going to draw near to you. There's something about turning to the Lord and fixing your eyes on Him in the middle of crisis where God comes and He takes all the pain, all the hurt, He grabs it, takes it out, He heals you. doesn't mean it didn't happen. It simply means he's given you this peace. This peace that surpasses all understanding. In the first phase in learning to come to the secret place, oftentimes is learning to go to the Lord in the middle of crisis. I learned to go to God in the middle of crisis as a young kid. My dad showed me how. But can you go to, Christ, go to the secret place and to the Lord in every single season of life? In every season, even when you're on the mountaintop, even when things are really, really good in your life, can you learn to go to the secret place just because you love Him and want to spend time with Him? I'm afraid what's often happened in my own life, and I'm so guilty of this, I've only gone to the secret place when I needed God to do something for me, such as comfort me because I have too much of a weight to bear. 
And it's oftentimes, it's like we, including myself here, we've treated God like a son who only goes to a father who needs money when we're in crisis but never spend time with him. And what God wants us to do is to learn how to go to the Lord in every season of life. You might be saying, Adam, how is this helping me this morning? Because there are promises for those in Psalm 91 who learn to go to the secret place. But it's only reserved for people who go to the secret place. If you are saved, you've given your life to the Lord, these promises in Psalm 91, I'm sorry to say they're not for you. If you're saved and you go to the secret place with the Lord, only when you have crisis, the promises of Psalm 91, they're not for you. But if you learn to go to the secret place, to spend time with the Lord, in every single season, there are 23 promises in Psalm 91 that are available to the person who learns to go into that place. To what? To commune with God, to fellowship with the Lord, to spend time with Him. Listen, God is real. He is real. And He wants so desperately to spend time with you. Listen to these promises in Psalm, in Psalm, uh, Psalm 91. There's 23 of them. For the person who in every season goes into the secret place, you shall, hide, you shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler. He shall deliver you from the pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night. You shall not be afraid of the arrow that flieth by day. You shall not be afraid of the pestilence that walks in the darkness. You shall not be afraid of that which destroys. The tenth promise, though 1,000 fall at your left and 10,000 at your right, it shall not come near you. The eleventh promise, only with your eyes will you see the reward of the wicked. The twelfth, there shall no evil befall you. There shall no plague come near your dwelling. God shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. They shall bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the dragon. God will deliver you. The eighteenth promise, God will set you on high. God will answer you. God will be with you in trouble. The 21st promise, God will honor you. God will satisfy you in long life. The 23rd promise for the one who learns to go in every single season in the secret place, God will show you his salvation. A person who is closely acquainted with God, that's the promises for that individual. Remember how we started. God will reward you openly for those who go into the secret place. If we learn just to trust God with our every need. If we learn just to trust God with our every single need. If we learn not just to go to him when we need something from him, but we learn to go to him every single morning. I mean, God has written us a love letter. May we open the word of God and may we study it. May we, may we dive into it and may the Lord just speak to us through it. May it not just be a checklist thing, but may we just read until the Lord just speaks to us. That's my goal in the morning. I'm gonna share that with you in a couple of weeks. It says, I wanna read until I feel like, man, God's spoken to me. I want to sit there until I feel like, man, the Lord has spoken to me this morning. I've heard the voice of God. Would you rise with me in this room? Many of you, you're going through crisis right now. Many of you are experiencing deep hurt, pain, so stuff has happened to you, and you are struggling. You learn to go to the secret place oftentimes in the middle of crisis first before you learn to go in every single season. I know that's the case for me. I'm still learning to go to God in every single season, to be honest with you. And not just when I need something from Him. You're going through a lot right now. 
If that is you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to know who I'm praying for.